Hello, everyone. Welcome. You're uh, here to see a webinar from the CPFF, and uh, we're here to uh, talk today about understanding medical, uh, sorry, assistance in dying, sometimes called MAID. Um, my name's Kelly Mills. I work in communications with CPFF, and we're really happy to have today as our guest, Kelly, Kelsey, sorry, not another Kelly, Kelsey Goforth from um, Dying with Dignity Canada. I'm just gonna give you a little intro. She's the Director of Programs at the Organization of Dying with Dignity Canada and has been a staff member with the organization since 2015. She's a graduate of Douglas College's End of Life Doula Program and Centennial College's Thanatology Certificate Program. She's completed a Patient Navigation Certificate from the Health Leadership and Learning Network at York University, as well as training in grief literacy. She has completed Pallium Canada's Learning Essential Approaches to Palliative Care, and she is the recipient of the 2019 Alumni of Influence Award from University College at the University of Toronto, where she completed her undergraduate studies in political science. So welcome, Kelsey. Um, I just want to let everyone know too, there's at the queue, and if you have questions as we go along, just um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I will transmit, I will read out your questions to Kelsey, and I'm sure there'll be a question period at the end. Okay, so Kelsey, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Just gonna share my screen here. We can get started. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you again for having me today. So what we'll go over during today's presentation is a little bit about Dying with Dignity Canada, the organization. I'll give a brief history of the MAID legislation here in Canada and um, some discussion about the current eligibility criteria for medical assistance in dying. Um, a little bit about what is next when it comes to MAID and some of the issues being examined. Um, we'll also get into some of the statistics to get a sense of what has been happening across the country in terms of who is accessing MAID um, and what their medical conditions are. Um, and then there is, um, of course, opportunity for questions. So a little bit about Dying with Dignity Canada. So we've been around for over 40 years, and throughout that time, we've been defending access to quality end-of-life choice and care. Uh, we are based out of Toronto. However, we're a national human rights charity and uh, support people from coast to coast. Um, despite having all of our staff based in Ontario, we do have chapters across the country who are on the ground in uh, many major cities um, from the East Coast all the way to BC. And what we focus on is improving quality of dying, protecting end of life rights and helping Canadians avoid unwanted suffering. So more specifically, we defend human rights by advocating for assisted dying rules that respect the Canadian constitution and the charter of rights and freedoms. We provide support to adults suffering from a grievous and irremediable medical condition. We educate people across Canada about their legal end of life options, including MAID, um, and the importance of advanced care planning is another uh, big component of our work. And we support healthcare practitioners who assess for and provide MAID. Uh, we are a charitable organization funded almost exclusively by individual Canadians. So to get us started, I'll go over a little bit about the MAID legislation that we have here in Canada and a little bit about the court cases that led to legislation being introduced in the country. So we had a law in Canada as of June 2016 called C-14, and this law initially required that one's death needed to be reasonably foreseeable. It's very important to note that this didn't mean terminal um, or having a set um, number of months to live, three months, six months, nothing like that. So what it meant instead was that a person's death was likely to occur that the cause of the person's death is predictable and that something has happened in that person's life to put them on a trajectory towards death. So despite it not meaning terminal, it still did leave out a number of suffering individuals. So we got a, another made law, a federal made law in March of 2021. This one was called C7. 
And the main component of this law to note is that it no longer required that a death be reasonably foreseeable. Instead of excluding people whose death was not reasonably foreseeable, it instead created a two stream system with different safeguards, depending on whether somebody's death was reasonably foreseeable or not reasonably foreseeable. It also introduced another um, option for people called a waiver of final consent. And we can get into that in more detail later, but essentially what this gave people is the, the option in some cases to say that if I lose capacity before the date that I would like to have made, I'm giving permission to the MAID provider to still go ahead. Um, so we will talk about the details of that a little bit later. And there was also in this law, a sunset clause related to MAID and mental disorders. And that means the, that MAID for those whose sole condition is a mental disorder. So a little bit about how we got these cases, or sorry, got these laws in the first place, it, it goes back to a number of court cases that were happening in Canada. So the first of note is called the Carter case, and this was in 2015. It was led by a woman named Kay Carter, who had spinal stenosis, and a woman named Gloria Taylor, who had ALS, alongside their families. And this, this court case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and there was a unanimous decision through that case that these individuals' rights were being um, um, prohibited and that their right to life, liberty, and security of person under Section 7 of the Charter was um, being infringed upon. So legislation was written, and that's how we got Bill C-14 in June 2016. However, it didn't fully align with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which led to another court case moving forward. And that was that of Jean Truchon and Nicole Gladue. Um, so these two individuals both lived in Quebec, and they suffered from incurable degenerative diseases. But they didn't qualify for MAID under the old law because of this requirement of needing to have a reasonably foreseeable natural death. So they fought successfully to have the law changed and argued that this reasonably foreseeable natural death requirement under the criminal code was overly strict and unconstitutional and prevented some people from being able to access um, MAID. So this decision wasn't appealed by the Quebec government nor the Canadian government and resulted in this new uh, law being formed, which is C7, which is still in place today. So we have a third case that's mentioned there. And this, the Lamb case involved a woman uh, named Julia Lamb. She was 25 at the time that the court case was moving forward. She lived in BC and she had spinal muscular atrophy. So she also launched a court case within days after the original law, C-14, being passed. Her case didn't move forward, though, after an expert witness in the case argued that Julia Lamb did, in fact, meet the criteria um, under C-14. So although her case didn't move forward, it did speak to the support that suffering Canadians had for choice at the end of life. So um, before we get into many of the details about uh, eligibility and procedural safeguards involved with MAID, um, we'll just briefly talk about the two types of MAID that are permitted in Canada under the federal law. Uh, one thing to note before we get into that, though, is terminology. So we refer to MAID as medical assistance in dying because it encompasses these two options that you see on your screen. Uh, we also don't refer to it as physician-assisted dying because in under the federal law and in most provinces throughout the country, nurse practitioners are also able to provide MAID and assess for eligibility. So we say physician, we're leaving out those nurse practitioners who are also involved in this work. So the two options that people have for MAID in Canada are um, either through an IV, clinician administered MAID, or self-administered or what we call oral MAID. So the, the first one's quite self-explanatory. We have a, a person, a nurse practitioner or doctor delivering those medications through the IV. And the second is a patient drinking a, a liquid uh, mixture of medication that would be um, 
put together through a compo compounding pharmacy. So both of those options together are what, uh, what refers to as made in Canada. The self-administration of made is extremely rare in Canada. If you look at um, stats from 2021, there were fewer than seven deaths from self-administered made across Canada. Um, and that's consistent with trends from previous years. So a little bit about the medications that are administered. Um, we do get questions about that quite often. So through the clinician administered or IV option of made, the first medication is called midazolam. It makes the person very relaxed and sleepy and it's what's delivered first um, during the IV uh, made. And following that, the next medication is called propofol. So this medication is used quite often in surgeries across Canada. If you've been put under um, for a surgical procedure, that's often the medication that's given. Um, this puts the person into very deep coma-like sleep and, um, and that's the second one that's delivered. And the final medication is called rocuronium and it's a neuromuscular blocker. And that's the medication that will stop the breathing muscles and following that, a lack of oxygen will lead to the person's heart um, stopping. So sometimes the medications vary a little bit depending on the, the area that a person lives in, but those are, are the common ones used. And the whole process for MAID is quite quick. Um, families who come forward and, and you know, speak to us after a loved one has had MAID um, are often quite shocked by how quick the, the process is. It's usually no more than 10 to 15 minutes um, for a person to die um, using those medications. So in terms of eligibility in Canada, um, you need to be eligible for publicly funded health services in Canada. There's no option under the Canadian law for people to travel into the country to receive MAID. So most often those who are eligible for publicly funded health care are Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Um, some countries in the world do allow people to come in to access medical assistance in dying. Um, Switzerland is, is one of them, but in Canada, that isn't an option. A person needs to be 18. They need to be capable of making healthcare decisions, and they need to give informed consent after having received all information needed to make the decision, including their diagnosis, forms of treatment, and other options to relieve suffering, including palliative care. Um, another question we get quite often, and it ties into the publicly funded health services piece, is if there's a cost to access MAID, like out of pocket for an individual. Um, there's no cost. It's funded through provincial and territorial health care the same way um, other health care is for people in Canada. Uh, next, in terms of eligibility, is a person does need to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition, and that means that all of the sub-bullets under that need to be met. So an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability, um, there needs to be suffering that's unbearable, that suffering could be uh, physical suffering or mental suffering, um, and um, they, there needs to be a serious illness, disease, or disability that the person has. So in terms of safeguards, one of them is a written request form. And these, the first few safeguards that I'll talk about are applicable to everybody, um, regardless of whether their death is considered reasonably foreseeable or not. Um, there are some other requirements for people whose, whose natural death is not reasonably foreseeable, but um, these first ones here apply to everybody. So this written request must be made and it needs to be witnessed by one independent witness. And we'll get into who an independent witness can be in a moment. Uh, people also have the opportunity to withdraw their request at any time um, throughout that process. So this written request, there's an example of the Ontario form on the screen there. Um, different provinces will have different forms. Um, they're all available online uh, for people who are curious about what they look like or who are considering uh, made themselves. Um, and these require a signature of one witness, as I mentioned. 
that witness can't be a beneficiary in the will. They can't be named in the will. They can't be receiving any other benefit from the person's death, whether that's, you know, a material benefit, like a, some sort of um, heirloom that's being passed down to them uh, or a monetary. They can't be receiving any sort of benefit from the person's death. They can't be the owner or operator of the healthcare facility where that person is living, and they can't be an unpaid caregiver. So they can be a paid caregiver if it's somebody, um, a PSW or somebody coming in to support the person, but it can't be an unpaid um, caregiver. So what we found, and they need to be 18 years of age or older and understand that the person that they're witnessing for is requesting made. Um, and one thing that we found very early on in made being a legal option in Canada back in 2016 is that um, individuals were often, you know, concerned with who do I find to witness my form because there's, um, you know, my family, but they often can't because they're going to receive something from my death. And there was also a stipulation in the, the original law, C-14, that uh, any caregiver was was not permitted to um, to be a witness. So some people only had their family or and they only had their care team around them. So this put people in a very awkward situation, being like, I could ask my neighbor, I could ask my you know child's best friend, or I could ask all these people, but it's also a very private decision for some people. So uh, what we ended up doing early in May, um, after legislation coming into effect was we created a program, um, independent witnessing program, so that people could be connected with trained volunteers to act as independent witnesses. And uh, that was a huge relief for many people who just felt either very stuck having, you know, absolutely nobody to witness for them, or who felt, um, you know, uncomfortable with the thought about asking somebody who was a little bit more removed um, because it, it was their, you know, private healthcare decision that they were making. So in terms of witnessing, in many provinces, it can be done virtually. This isn't consistent. It, it is very uh, dependent on where you are in the country. But one thing that did come out of COVID is a lot of provinces did become more open to being able to do this virtually. Um, in Ontario, that's permitted. Um, in several other provinces throughout uh, Canada, it, it also is, but it's something to look into. Okay, so as I mentioned before, there's other safeguards for those who are considered uh, track to or non reasonably foreseeable. I mentioned that out of the law C7, we got this two track system. So it was no longer um, not possible for a person to move forward with MAID if they didn't have a reasonably foreseeable death. But what it did do is create a different uh, set of safeguards, a different procedural uh, mechanism for people, um, depending on their reasonably foreseeable natural death um, determination or not. So some of the, the key differences here um, is the waiver of final consent, which I mentioned. Uh, that is only available for those who have a reasonably forese foreseeable natural death, and we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later on as well. Uh, individuals who are considered to be under the track one um, procedural safeguards piece, they must be informed of available treatment options. There's also no minimum weight for those individuals. So um, under the track two option, however, there is and that is a 90 day assessment period. What we see in practice is even though it's a minimum 90 days, uh, those assessments often take much, much longer than that. Um, so track one, no wait time, track two, there is that minimum of 90 days. Everybody regardless of whether they're considered track one or track two does need to be assessed by two doctors or nurse practitioners. Another uh, extra safeguard under track two is that one of those doctors or nurse practitioners needs to have expertise in the condition that's causing the person suffering. And if those two assessors do not have that expertise, then they need to consult with a third person who does um, and take their um, consultation notes into account as they do their assessments. 
And I think that about covers those options. Um, oh, other other uh, safeguards for track two is that a person needs to be informed of available and appropriate means to relieve suffering. And everybody, the two uh, clinicians doing assessments, as well as the patient, must agree that they've seriously considered other means to relieve their suffering. So we talked about this already, but that's just a, another overview of the witnessing component and uh, what's required there. Um, it is a lot uh, more patient friendly, I'd say, than it was under the previous law. Um, and um, the other big change from the previous law to now is that it used to require two witnesses. Now it just requires one. So a big question that we get is about capacity, and this is often a major concern with individuals. This has been a major concern from the very beginning um, of MAID eligibility in Canada. So what's required um, during a MAID assessment is that everybody needs to have capacity. So a patient has to have the capacity to communicate with the clinicians um, and be you know, fully capable during that assessment process. Um, there's no option under the current law for a family member to make the decision for somebody to have made on their behalf. There's no option to put in an advanced care plan, for example, if XYZ happens to me, I give my spouse, my child, my best friend, whoever permission to um, advocate for me to get made on my behalf. That's currently not an option um, at all under the, the current law. So people need to be able to communicate their choice to appreciate the implications of the choice being made and be able to communicate with those assessors during the assessment. So the big change that we did see though is that before Bill C-7 came into effect, capacity was required um, at the time of death. And what this caused was a lot of, uh, we feel, unnecessary suffering for individuals and a very unfair choice for some individuals as well. And the most prominent example of this barrier was that of Audrey Parker. Audrey Parker spoke very publicly about her experience with MAID. She was a woman in her 50s. She lived in Halifax. Um, she had cancer that spread from her breast to her brain, um, and she was, uh, her death was, was imminent. She went through the whole process and was assessed by the two assessors. She filled out the paperwork. All of these pieces were, were done. Uh, what she really wanted, though, was to try to make it to one more Christmas and one more holiday with her family. Um, but because of this concern that if I lose capacity, before then, then I lose the, the option to have made. What she decided to do was die instead in early November because she didn't want to take that, that risk. So what came out of um, Bill C-7 in March 2021 was the passage of what's called Audrey's Amendment, and it's uh, also called the Waiver of Final Consent. So this gives individuals, under some circumstances, the opportunity to say, I, I feel comfortable not giving consent at that very moment before my death, uh, and I'm giving permission to the maid assessor, uh, maid provider to move forward um, anyway. I think we have a slide that will get into the, uh, the details of that. So um, some of the key important pieces here is that a person does need to be assessed and approved. So that means that they've met all the criteria. So all the pieces we talked about earlier, they're 18 years of age, they have a grievous and irremediable condition, they have capacity, they're, you know, during their assessments, they're being able to speak to their wishes and speak to the, what their health journey has been so far. Um, and they've been found eligible by two assessors. So it's only an option for those who are considered track one, you need to have a reasonably foreseeable natural death. If you're track two and you don't have a reasonably foreseeable natural death, this isn't an option for people. The other thing that's important to keep in mind here is that this is a decision between uh, the, the patient and the provider. It's not a general statement saying if 
this happens, I want somebody to give me made. It's saying that if I lose capacity before the state, I want doctor, whoever to give me made, or I want nurse practitioner, whoever to give me made. Um, so it is a, a, a written document between that patient and that provider. And the other thing too, is that it, there has to be a date that is specified. So it can't be some, if this happens sometime in the next three months, this is what I want. Uh, a person has to say, you know, I'm planning to have made on December 1st, but if something happens between today and then, I'm giving permission for my clinician to move forward on December 1st or before. Um, so those are some of the sort of common misunderstandings is that it can be kind of an open-ended thing. Uh, that's not the case. There has to be a date named. There has to be a, a provider named. And the person had to have gone through all of the process already so that if they wanted to have made today, they could. What they're saying is, I actually want to try to wait a little bit longer because there's a birthday, there's a wedding, there's the holidays, there's something I want to try to stick around for if I can. But if that's not an option, I'm giving the clinician permission to, to move forward just in case something happens uh, before then. So if the applicant does lose capacity, that made provider can go forward so long as there's no indication that the person um, doesn't want made any longer, any gestures or, or words to indicate that they don't want made. Okay, so a little bit about what the process looks like. And um, this is speaking generally. So if people have questions about their specific province or region, um, we do have resources on our website that speak uh, in more detail to the, the different provinces and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, this is a little bit about what the process looks like. So an individual can uh, speak to their own family doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, what we found is that relatively few uh, clinicians in, in Canada are made providers. So a person might speak to their doctor and they might say, you know, I, I can see why you're interested in this or I, you know, I support this. I just don't do it myself. I'm not currently a made provider. Um, and what people can do in that case is contact their provincial made team. Uh, in, in some provinces, there are specific rules in place for effective referrals. One of those provinces is Ontario. So an individual speaking to their clinician in Ontario, um, if that clinician is not involved with MAID or not willing to assess them and sort of move through the process with them, uh, there is a requirement that that clinician in a timely manner connects them to either a colleague that they know is a MAID provider or an agency, like a provincial MAID team, who can um, get them connected with, with those clinicians. Uh, then the assessment process, the length of time for an assessment really depends. It, it is very case by case. Um, we'll get a little bit, we'll go into more detail about an assessment in a moment. Um, one thing that we, we do find, depending again on people's location in the country, is sometimes there is a bit of a wait to get connected with a MAID provider. Uh, so that's something for, for those who are considering made to keep in mind. Uh, there is that written request that I mentioned. And in, in terms of order, this does vary. So um, in, in many places, there's no requirement that the paperwork is the very first thing that you do. Some people will call the MAID team, get connected with an assessor, and then fill out the form. Um, other MAID teams want you to fill out the form as the first step. So there's nothing in the federal law that kind of lays out, it has to be this and then this, um, but different MAID teams and providers will have their own thoughts on that. And um, in terms of a, a provision, provision um, or having MAID, the date of MAID, um, that often comes down to working with the MAID provider and, and getting an understanding of what what your goals are and what you're you're looking to to do in terms of MAID. Uh, clinicians tend to be um, extremely flexible and and very patient centered. So if there are you know special requests that people have for who they want present or 
um, anything they want to do ahead of time. Some people will have sort of a living wake or, or you know, different end of life options like that before me. Many of the clinicians are, are very, um, very open to working with a person so that the end of life experience is, is what they're, they're hoping to, uh, to achieve. And the other piece is um, related to, depending on where somebody has made, of course, um, there's other things to consider, such as coordinating with a funeral home, um, if somebody's dying in their home, for instance. Um, and in terms of timing, a person, in theory, if, if they're considered track one or having a reasonably foreseeable natural death, um, in theory, they could have the, the maid um, procedure rather quickly, um, since there is no wait uh, period in the, the federal law. Um, but again, this, this really varies. We've seen individuals who go through the process, are deemed eligible, and then they wait a couple months because there's thing that, things that they want to do and, and you know, uh, they want to live their, their life and, and enjoy the time that they have left and they're feeling, you know, well enough to do that. Um, and then other people whose suffering has just reached the point that it's so unbearable that they're ready to go um, right away and, and want to, to have made within the next day or two. So it is very dependent on the individual situation. So a MAID assessment, we, we do get a lot of questions about the MAID assessment. Um, people are often uh, a little stressed out about what that means and what's considered during a MAID assessment and what people are going to ask. And um, some people are, are suffering uh, so intolerably that they, um, you know, the thought of having an assessment can be quite onerous. Um, so we did provide and create an assessment guide. It's online um, for anybody who's interested. And it just clarifies a little bit about what an assessment is like so that people can go in with that, that knowledge. Um, it is an opportunity for the patient to share their experience and discuss their values, their level of suffering, their quality of life. Um, it's meant to help the assessor get to know the patient and understand their request and their life experiences. Um, it often isn't just talking about the medical side of things because clinicians, of course, are reviewing medical records and understanding, you know, test results and that kind of kind of thing, but it's also understanding the person um, as, a, as a person and their social history. So who they have in their life, their social, their, their spouse, their children, their social um, support system, their hobbies, their interests, what they did for work, values and beliefs, whether those are personal or cultural or religious. Of course, the medical history questions about medications and surgeries and um, any mobility concerns that people have had, um, and also understanding the main request. You know, why, why is this something that you're interested in? Have you been considering this for a long time, or is this something that you've considered more recently? Um, what does suffering look like to you? What are those options, um, those other options that you you've considered? Have you looked into palliative care? Is that something we can offer you? So it's it's um, most of them do take place in person. Um, again, with with the pandemic, everybody has turned to uh, virtual options as well. Um, so depending on the the province, um, Zoom or other virtual options can be used, but ultimately meeting in person is is certainly preferred. And uh, as mentioned, the the length of time can be can really vary depending on the situation. Uh, track two assessments often take a lot longer and, and despite there being a, a legal requirement for two assessors to assess somebody, um, often there's more assessments over many months um, involved with a track two um, assessment. So there's a number of resources across Canada for those who are interested in, in um, seeing other organizations that are out there and working in this space. Um, so one is called Bridge C14, and the C14 comes from the name of the original MAID law from 2016. 
So they're a national nonprofit and they provide uh, meaningful connections to families and loved ones throughout all stages of, of MAID. And the other organization is MAID Family Support Society and that provides peer-to-peer -peer support for those who are supporting um, a loved one through an assisted death. So they do a lot of the emotional support work, these two organizations, um, in terms of how to access them, the, the information's on the screen there. They also work to um, be as accessible as they can. So there's often in-person options, phone, um, different online video conferencing. So they, they try to meet people where they're at and, and provide that support. So in, in terms of Dying with Dignity Canada support, uh, we're available if people have questions about made. Uh, we can answer general questions. We're not assessors or providers. So if it's a very clinical question, we encourage people to talk to a doctor or nurse practitioner to get those answered. Um, but we can speak to the made law. And, um, and we also uh, have a list. As I mentioned, there's some slight differences from province to province. So we do have a page um, that kind of speaks to what to expect if somebody's going through MAID in each of the, the regions throughout Canada. We also have a number of other resources. So the MAID assessment guide that I mentioned, we have a document about how to prepare for MAID death. Um, then we have some pieces that are less related to MAID and, and more related to end of life in general. So patient rights um, is a big part of our work as well as advanced care planning. Um, so plenty of resources on our website about that. And uh, we also have a, a patient advocate guide online as well. So all of these are free um, to download. If people want a paper copy sent to them, just reach out to us and we're happy to mail those to, to folks. We also have support directories. So by province and also a national list of um, other end of life and mental health services, palliative care services, social supports, um, all sorts of, of different um, wonderful groups doing work. So that's another piece on our website. Uh, we also do a lot of webinars. This is a, a big part of our work. Again, they're all free for people to attend and we record as many of them as we can. So uh, we have quite the uh, list on, on our website. We talk about things like grief. We talk about advanced care planning, uh, information on MAID, of course, and uh, regional spotlights. So again, speaking to uh, death and dying in various provinces throughout the country. Uh, we talk about obituaries, palliative care, caring for yourself as an advocate. Um, we recently had um, community paramedics and palliative care paramedics speaking about their roles. Um, we've partnered with cancer organizations to speak about um, the supports for people and their families going through a cancer journey. And uh, again, all of those are accessible on our website. So back to me, just to give a, a little sense of what's what might be coming um, when it comes to assisted dying in Canada. Um, there's been a number of reviews and uh, groups working on various aspects of MAID. Um, one is a special joint committee that was tasked to conduct a parliamentary review on a number of different issues. You can see those on your screen. And um, this joint committee did their work and created a report that's available online. Um, and currently the one piece that's mentioned here is um, that does have a, a sort of date tied to it is made for mental disorders. So this was originally scheduled to become law in um, March of 2023, March 17th, but that's been delayed by one year. So that instead will be March 17th, 2023, 2024, sorry. Um, and one thing to mention here too, just to clarify is that this refers to made for those whose um, whose sole condition is a mental disorder. So it doesn't mean that a person who has another qualifying condition, but also has a history of mental disorders wouldn't qualify. So a person might have a terminal cancer and they meet all the criteria in the law, but they've also had depression off and on throughout their life. 
that person likely would still qualify for MAID so long as their depression isn't clouding their decision-making capacity. Um, but what this is talking about is MAID for mental disorders as the sole condition. So they don't have another condition that may lead to their eligibility. So finally, before we wrap up and open up for questions, we do have um, some statistics to share. So what I'm about to share is all from 2021. We are expecting 2022 data really any day now. Uh, each year, the uh, Health Canada does release stats from the previous year. We're just waiting on last year's stats. So um, in 2021, of made, a deaths, made deaths accounted for 3.3% of deaths in Canada, and uh, the total number of deaths since made was passed in 2016 is uh, over 3,100. And in terms of palliative care, um, almost 81% of made recipients also received palliative care. And of those who didn't receive palliative care, 88% had access to those services if they required them. Uh, with disability supports, 43% of individuals who received MAID required disability support services, and of these, 87% received those services. In terms of who's accessing MAID in Canada, the average age was just over 76, and overwhelmingly, um, most of those individuals had a cancer diagnosis. Now, 2021 was the first year where we had um, non-reasonably foreseeable natural deaths as an option in Canada. So we had uh, uh, 219 individuals did have a, a non-reasonably foreseeable natural death in that year. That's 2.2% of the total made provisions. And the average age for those individuals was uh, 70 years old. And most of them had a neurological condition. So I had mentioned this early on that um, when it comes to MAID providers and people going to their family doctors and asking them for assistance with, um, with MAID, um, many people will have those conversations, but their, their primary care provider isn't necessarily involved with MAID. So what we have across Canada is um, uh, 1,577 unique MAID providers across the country. Uh, most of which are physicians, but we do have some nurse practitioners um, involved, and uh, most of them are family doctors. But again, there's a wide range of, of, um, of types of doctors who are involved with MAID. And that is it for the formal part of the presentation. Um, my email is there, and if anybody has questions, we're, we're certainly available. Um, I will stop my screen sharing. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, there was a few, and I'm thinking that some of them are, you've maybe answered as we've gone through, but okay. um, you did mention that in the in the different categories, like the, the one and two, the, mm -hmm. the made assessment is gonna take longer for for the track two, the, the mm -hmm. not a reasonable expectation. And I guess this a starting point that, the question that I have before we get into some of these is we're talking mainly here to people with um, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, it is a, a chronic and progressive disease and um, it does, you know, hasten death, but you know, it can, it, it can vary like a, a mortality rates can vary from, you know, two years to 10 years or 20 even. Mm -hmm. So how would, how do they decide or who decides, I guess, whether it's reasonably foreseeable? Um, yeah. I guess you find that with other like things like Parkinson's, for instance, and, and some conditions like not so much with cancer. Uh, it, and also the PF is not always really predictable. Like you can decline very quickly, um, like go along for some time and then have an acute, what they call an acute exacerbation. And then quickly go downhill. So uh, how do they determine, I guess, whether um, if you have pulmonary fibrosis, if you would be, you know, it's foreseeable or, or not? Like, 
Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. And it's it's certainly one that would be decided by the nurse practitioners and doctors doing the assessment after looking at um, everything that a person has been experiencing with their health um, and what has changed over the last several right. months or years and how things mm -hmm. are progressing. But one example, just to give a bit of context, because back when the law came into effect in 2016, we had this very legal term, reasonably foreseeable natural death. Like, what, mm -hmm. what does that mean when it comes to somebody's health? So a lot of the clinicians were like, hmm, this is kind of an interesting term. How do we go about mm -hmm. doing exactly what you said, figuring that out? So there was a woman in Ontario who... Um, she was in her late 70s and she when she was first assessed the clinician said you know i think you meet the criteria but this reasonably foreseeable natural death thing i'm not too sure so i don't i don't want to move ahead because i'm not sure if this applies to you so she actually went through the superior court system in ontario and uh, a judge weighed in on her case so this woman she was 77 she the condition that she had was osteoarthritis. So again, that's something that could go on for quite a some lot of, time. yes, exactly. A lot of people have also. Yeah. Right. For sure. And that could go on for a while. It's not something like a, a terminal cancer that's going to end her life in the next couple of years or months even. Um, so she went through the court system and they did find that she would meet the, the eligibility criteria, despite the fact that she might live for another 10 years. And that was under um, the original law where non-reasonably foreseeable wasn't even an option. Mm -hmm. So that really gave people, um, clinicians, quite a bit more context as to what they're looking at. And again, looking at what has changed in the person's life, this diagnosis and this decline that they're experiencing in their health and what has that um, how has that impacted their trajectory and where they're going next and mm -hmm. what's reasonably predictable mm -hmm. so we don't know if it's going to be in six months or six years but can we reasonably predict how things are going to to play out for an individual mm -hmm. um, there is a really helpful um, document. It's through an organization called CAMAP, which is the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers. Um, so they're clinicians and they have released a document on reasonably foreseeable natural death. So it is, it, and it's available online um, for anybody to access, but if people wanted to read that, that does give a little bit more as to what is being considered from the clinical side. Okay. Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I can see with people with PF too, there's, um, I guess there, there's the thing about what is, you know, their quality of life to that individual. Would that be, that's part of when they're doing their assessment too. Like maybe once they have to be at home all the time or they can't go out or once they, uh, I mean, I've, I've heard about people talking about uh, as long as they can eat ice cream and watch the football game, they're good, like their quality of life is good. Or, you know, other people say, well, if I can't, you know, leave my house and walk anymore and, or whatever, there's sort of like a different um, perception for each individual too, right? On what's, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, that's my phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Just let me turn that off, my apologies. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I was curious too, um, where does MAID usually, take place somebody was asking sorry it wasn't just me um are, do most people have it done at home or in the hospital or mm -hmm. or their long-term care facility is there like a mm -hmm. it can be in any of those places or yeah um so it depends i can get um i don't have the stat handy but from the 2021 mm -hmm. report it does have a breakdown of where people did um die with me so in theory so those options are all like you can have They're, someone come to your home and do exactly. this for you? Okay. Yeah, exactly. And people who are already at home often want that mm -hmm. as their option. If some people are in a hospital and moving them out is not really doable. So they mm -hmm. end up having made there if, if their hospital allows it, which is a whole other uh, issue that we're running into. But uh, yes, it can make can happen anywhere uh, in theory. In theory. Okay. Um, are there limits to somebody was asking like are there limits to how many people can be 
with you at during Maid, or is that again something you discuss with the provider? Yeah, it's it's certainly something to discuss. Um, I think providers overwhelmingly want whatever you want. So if you want just a couple people, that's fine. If you want lots of people, that's that's also fine. Of course, during COVID and institutions mm -hmm. and distancing, you know, all these things, it caused a bit of uh, additional stress and considerations. But even then, you know, clinicians are looking at this being, you know, your death and and wanting it to be as um, aligned with what you want. So, um, yeah, people are are often willing to to um, yeah. work with your request. And someone else was um, asking too about how long it takes. Now, I know at some point you um, mentioned early in the thing that people were surprised at how quickly um, someone would pass away. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you said like 10 to 15 minutes. Is this kind of like the normal? Mm -hmm. So your so-called your appointment, like your your practitioner or whoever does it for you is just there. They, they come and they leave. I don't know. Is it, are they there yeah. a bit longer? Or? Yeah, they'll be there a bit longer. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll come. And um, again, it depends on what, what's going on. So some people have, are having visitors all morning or, you know, having, mm -hmm. you know, playing music or doing whatever that they want to do to make mm -hmm. their, their experience um, what they want it to be. So a clinician will come and they, have to get organized on their end and get their their medication set up and then it comes down to when when the person's feeling ready the um, delivery of the medications through the IV is the part that's quite quick it's mm -hmm. you know the 10 to 15 minutes uh, usually but um, and then the clinician will again if, if people want to talk to the clinician before or after and ask questions you know they're there to to support um, the family in that aspect too Okay, and then um, it, it, is this like if you were doing this at home, does does the coroner have to come like to, is that a coroner case? Like I know sometimes if you don't, if someone dies at home, the coroner comes. So is that different with MAID or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so each province is a little different, okay. but um, usually no. So in Ontario, for instance, um, I think they've changed the requirements somewhat recently, but mm -hmm. throughout most of made, the clinician would call the, the coroner's office right after the person has died and say, you know, I, this has happened and I'm sending over the documents. The coroner will take a look at everything and say, okay, we can release the body to the funeral home. And that'll, you know, didn't take too, too long. Um, but yeah, usually there's no, no requirement for the coroner to be involved beyond something like that just a call from the doctor or nurse practitioner um right after the, the passing yep. the death yeah okay um somebody and i'm sure this comes up um there was two sort of related questions one i think you addressed a little bit and that was uh what do you do or what happens if your family physician or counsel you know counsels you against me like is not um cooperative or however you want to say it and the other case they also talked about is what if your family members are not in agreement with your wish how how can you address either one i know one you said in ontario was it only that they're required to you know refer you to someone else then that does do it um so maybe you could look at the the first one first mm -hmm. the the provider um and then family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. Um, so for the provider, um, yeah, if, if people are in a position where they're not being supported in whatever way, um, in most places across Canada, the provincial made coordination team is available to talk to you um, directly without your clinician, you know, making a referral. Mm -hmm. There's a couple exceptions to that. One is the Ottawa area, so that they do require a referral, but um, that's just one that kind of stands out. The rest of the country are uh, quite willing to just talk to you directly as the patient. Um, so that's an option for people. And 
even in some places where there are those requirements for an effective referral or an effective transfer of care, uh, sometimes in practice it doesn't play out that way. So people are still, you know, having to call themselves. So that's uh, that's an option for people. Um, and then with the family piece, you know, there are some of those organizations I mentioned. So like the Made Family Support um, Society is extremely helpful. Everybody who's um, a part of that organization who's supporting um, other people in the community, they've gone through a similar experience. So, you know, if you have a spouse or a child or, you know, whoever your relationship is who's really struggling and might benefit from talking to someone else, um, they'll pair you up with somebody else who has experienced a maid death of their parent or spouse or child mm -hmm. or whoever. So um, they're really wonderful for that. And the same with Bridge C14. So Bridge for C14, if, if you yourself are considering maid or going through the process and are running into some um, you know, struggles with communicating with your loved one or you know, they're just not really supporting you, they're a good organization to speak to. Um, others will also speak directly to their maid provider and say, you know, this is what's going on. Would you be able to have a conversation with my my loved one? Um, and then it's, you know, I've heard very positive stories where at the beginning people weren't really supportive, and as they learned more and as things kind of progressed, they they came around and and were supportive of their loved one. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a lot of blog stories on our website of people have gone through MAID and, mm -hmm. and some of them will share those stories. So that's another place to go for some mm -hmm. added uh, support. And you have, um, you provided in here that some of the um, contacts for that bridge C C14 yeah. and things like that. So I can add those um, to the article. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to look if there's something else. No, I think. I think I've asked, Was is there anything that you've missed that maybe my questions have brought to mind? Is there, or it's been pretty extensive and it's a lot of information to take in. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah. Obviously, to... yeah, it looks like your organization has a lot of um, resources too available. So we'll make sure that we uh, put that, um, the website on there too, that people can go there and find all kinds obviously of resources. Um, so thank you very much. It was very okay. informative. Um, I know it's a tough topic and, um, but it's better to have some, you know, background information, be clear about some of those things, the requirements you were very helpful about, you know, the witness for instance, and the, the reasonable foreseeable and, and, you know, sort of doing some of those things for people that's, um, that's really helpful. Um, I'll write a bit of a story too. And, uh, for those who don't want to watch the whole hour, they can get the highlights in a, in a few um, prescient points and, uh, and of course, the links to the whole thing. So thank you again so very much, uh, Kelsey. It was very helpful. No problem. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.